that. Ah, funny that you cannot see this. Okay, here would be a slide. Maybe you can see it like this. Welcome, first of all, everybody that's also watching at home. Um, so this would be, ah, yes, you can see it. Um, so we have the DNA of XR, which consists out of our story, also consisting of our demands, then our strategy, like what is our strategy towards the government and towards creating change, and then also our structure. So how do we operate? How do we govern together? Um, and how do we make decisions? All these kind of things. And today we'll dive a little bit more into the structure um, aspect of that. So that is the self-organizing system trainings. Um, and it's just really the basis of what kind of elements um, come, come into that. Now, so what we'll discuss today um, is what is self-organizing systems? Um, why do we work with self-organizing systems? And then we'll go a little bit into the, into the six principles of it. And then we also apply it to the CNC because that is the most relevant context for us. Um, and then also, if you have questions and comments, please like feel free to shoot them at any time. Um, yeah, so we'll take it from there. Oh, so yeah, um, what is self-organizing systems? Um, first of all, I want to clarify something, which is that self-organizing systems is an umbrella term. So we often also use sociocracy or holacracy as terms, but are actually like that are ways of self-organizing but because we are not strictly doing sociocracy or holacracy we kind of like have an overarching umbrella term of self-organizing systems um so what are self-organizing systems then that is moving from a hierarchical um, way of organizing to more of an organism or organism so also really more into like a living system and how can we be adaptive resilient and also with as very innovative and experimentative um, so really, it's also a shift from moving from control to trust. So instead of one person or a small board like controlling what other people do, you move to trust that individuals can make or groups, circles can make good, considerate decisions. Um, and you can also see that with um, how we operate, that we have 10 principles and values and not anyone can just take action in the name of XR with these 10, 10 principles and values and they don't have to ask for permission all the time. So that is really like this, this self-organizing system attitude. Um, and it's also way more systematic. It's, in, like, it's not relying on certain individuals, but it's really that anyone can step up and do certain things. Um, it's also a way of getting things done and also balancing collective wisdom. As you can see um, here, it's a, a balance between autonomy and collaboration. On the one hand, people can just take decisions. On the other hand, you also want people to collaborate. So when do you discuss things and make decisions together? And when do you give the mandate to a certain role or certain circle to make decisions themselves? So that tension between autonomy and collaboration will also explore a little bit today. Um, yes, so why is it important? Why do we have this? Um, as I already said before, like on the one hand, we want to get the wisdom out of the group and really like have this that we adapt, that we move together, that we really use the best of that. And on the other hand, we want to maintain the individual speed and initi initiative. So we don't want to slow down kind of that, that energy. Um, so why should we then look into structures because actually there is not such a thing as a structureless group so if we don't make it explicit our power dynamics our relations every like all these kind of things then um it will establish in an implicit way so if we make it explicit if we work on it if we reflect on it we can see which kind of values we want to have in our organizational structure rather than just automatically reproducing um, the injustices that we see um, all around us. So that is also really our aim. And I would just very briefly like kind of touch upon the paradigm shift that self-organizing systems bring and also how that is reflected in our 10 principles and values. So it is a new way of working. And I think that's also what our fourth value of we openly challenge ourselves and this toxic system. So it's really a new way of organizing, which is also very challenging. Um, because we often don't know so well how to do it, how to work with, with self-organizing systems. But we challenge ourselves to not reproduce the injustices that we see. And with that, we also value reflection and learning. So we move also through these cycles and nature moves a lot of cycles in the sense of we have action, for example, September rebellion, then we have reflection where we see like, hey, how did that actually go? Then we learn together, like for example, this training, like how can we, like what kind of skills do we need? And then we plan ahead again for the next rebellion or for the next action. So also these cycles um, allow for experimentation and adaptation in between. 
Yeah, and then principle seven, we actively mitigate for power. Um, Self-organizing systems is also a way of breaking the hierarchies of power and making sure that everybody can participate in an equal way because you work in circles um, and with consent, and among which we will touch in a bit. Then we're also based on autonomy and decentralization, um, which we'll also already touch upon. And what does autonomy then mean? Um, it means that you have the ability to self-govern and to make decisions um, and do things without asking permission. So that means that not every small circle needs to go to the CC, for example, to ask for permission, but that you can also just do certain things. Um, so it works with trust, um, and it also makes sure that with decentralization, no centralized authority is existent. Um, yes. So then we are autonomous, but we also want to cooperate because we have a share, uh, like a shared purpose. Um, so we as XR, we have a purpose together. So how do you make sure we still move towards the same purpose and the same vision, um, but that we can also be autonomous um, as our first value? Um, okay, so that is a little bit on like why self-organizing systems, why is it important and why do we work with it? Um, and then for this training, we'll dive into the six principles and values and then the structure. Um, and what is maybe good to know is that also more people within NIX are working on this. So we have an, um, a constitution, which is very recently kind of like, kind of done, well, although it's never done because it's always evolving. And that is just a document that explains the very basic things. And it's a bit of a dry document, but it can really, like it can serve really well if you forgot, for example, what consent decision making is exactly, then you can look it up in the document and just read over it again. And we also have a guide where it's a bit more of a practical approach where you also get certain tools like how can you, for example, track projects or how can you write a mandate and like more of the practical tools. Um, and then we also just very recently have an SOS working group where you can ask questions to if you don't know how to approach a certain situation. Um, so, yeah, that is it for now. So I will dive into the principles. But before that, are there any questions about this so far? No? Okay. Um, yes, so the very first principle is um, share purpose. So you have SXR, we have a share purpose, um, and we need to agree on that in order to work, like, um, organize effectively. And one, one person, a sociocracy trainer, always used this um, example of sports. Like, if you are um, aiming to play, if the purpose is to play soccer and someone comes with a tennis like net and puts it in the middle of the field because they want to play tennis, you have a conflict, right? Because they have a different purpose. So you cannot do your sport if you don't have a shared purpose and vision on what you want to do. And with an organization, it's kind of the same. If other people constantly want to do something else within your organization, it's kind of tricky. So you really want to have a shared purpose of where are we moving towards. And that also goes for circles. So as a CC, for example, you will also want to have a shared purpose, but also, for example, as a media and communication circle or as a political strategy circle, what is your purpose and how are you contributing to that? Um, and in that, we have a hierarchy of purpose because the overall purpose of XR, you can see as the outermost layer in this in this picture. And then it's a nested way of how these circles relate. So like then in that, you have a couple of other circles again. So, and all of them have a purpose contributing to the overall purpose of XR and L. So that could be indeed like political strategy, um, finances having a purpose that helps supporting the overall purpose of XR and L. Um, so in this way, you have like you break down the purposes in ever like smaller circles. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, then the second principle is consent uh, based decision making. So instead of uh, either having having majority votes or consensus where you ask, do you approve and or is it your preference? We move to consent, which is do you have an objection, which is a very different question. Like, can you live with it? And why we do that is because we want to be able to experiment a lot with things and not ask necessarily if everybody preference because it slows down a lot. So it's really about do you have an objection? Um, and what I do think is the interesting thing of this is that if you don't work with majority, you also acknowledge that often smaller groups or people that don't necessarily directly consent to it have a lot of ex other experiences or wisdom that they can bring in. So with objecting, you can see, hey, why are they objecting and how can we then like change the proposal in order to make it better rather than seeing it like as, as a, I don't know, as, a, as bothersome or whatsoever. Um, so it's also a nice way of not going into like 
yeah, basic um, majority vote. So here again, a little bit on what is the difference between an objection and personal preference. So personal preference is really like, do I want that? What what do I want? What do I prefer? An objection is is maybe not what I ex actually want, but I can still live with it. Um, so also when you object to it, like think think about that. Um, actually, I would like to say a tiny bit more about this because usually you do consent rounds. Um, in in order to make a decision, you have different rounds, and you start with. Um, an understanding round where you ask questions. So there's, for example, a proposal. Let's take the proposal of the restructuring, which we'll discuss today. And then first you start asking questions, like does everybody see the same elephant kind of thing? Do we all understand the same proposal? So you have, like, you start understanding it, asking questions. Then the second round consists of out of exploration. So you can give comments on it, like, hmm, I thought this when I read the proposal, I thought this. And then you start exploring, like, hey, what does this actually contain? And then the last round is the consent decision round. So you ask everybody, do you consent to the proposal? And if there are objections one by one, you solve them by integrating them in a proposal. Um, so with this, you have like these, these three different rounds where you usually go one by one and ask everybody. And this also gives clarity. So if we're in the CC or in any other meeting together, you can also know, ah, we are now in the first or in the second round. And it also gives a bit of like clarity and stability. Um, yes, then distributed authority. Um, so we spread that across groups and roles so it doesn't accumulate. And we also want to make that explicit. So we really know which person is holding what kind of role. So this person can also really own it, but it also just gives clarity and also on circles. So it's really important to also know what kind of circles do we actually have? For example, I for a very long time didn't know there was XR therapists. Or, like, or trust people within XR. And then I was always thought, oh, I need to deal with this myself when there is a conflict or whatsoever. Instead of, if you know that there are um, certain roles and groups that have actually, um, that, that are having that role, you can also contact them. So it's very important that we have this distributed authority, but also, we'll get to questions in a bit, that we know um, that, they, that they are there. That So there are clear mandates about who is actually um, carrying these roles and these um, accountabilities. Okay, and man to mandate to get in a bit, maybe also to check if there are questions so far. No? Yeah, I have like general questions, but maybe that's more for like the end. Yeah, then I would also suggest that we do that in the end. Yeah, if, if that's okay. fine to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Then mandates. Um, so a mandate consists out of the purpose of your circle or of a role and the accountabilities. Um, so what do you need in order to achieve your purpose? And then also your domain, which consists out of exclusive authority. So for example, you are the one allowed to change the website and nobody else is because otherwise it gets a mess. Gets a mess. Um, so yeah, or the social media account or whatsoever. And then policies are constraints of authority to the impacts of the domain of a circle role. So this really makes clear like, hey, what kind of different domains and accountabilities are covered and where are still opportunities or are tensions? Um, yeah. And we also have templates for this, for like writing your mandates. I think most of the circles have already done it, but you can also do it for roles. Um, yeah, and so it's very quickly to go back to the third, you can also, if you have a circle, you can also split it up in very clear defined roles, like this person is, for example, um, um, mandated to order flyers within the art circle or something like that. So you know that you distribute the authority to that person and you have a very clear role description and you know this person is going to do it. Um, Yes, so when we have mandates, um, we also have certain roles, as I already said, and these are four very common roles that are in almost every circle, um, which is the internal coordinator, rather like focusing internally, and then the external coordinator or the representative connecting with the other circles in the wider circle, and then the facilitator and the secretary. So then communication, because if we have all these mandates and if we have all these things, um, we still need to communicate our decisions to each other so we know that we're all up to date, but also that we involve the people that are affected by it. So if we make a certain decision, for example, we want to change um, 
the language that we are usually operating in, then we also need to involve other people get affected by that. Um, so that's why we also sometimes use additional democratic processes, which are, for example, people's assemblies or whatsoever. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't just make a decision, but we also communicate it properly and invite people in the decision making process. Um, and then lastly, transparency. So it makes it easier to collaborate if you're clear about your mandates and the work that you're doing and um, also like what other people's mandates are. So that's also what we're doing now. Like we're trying to visualize how these different mandates relate to each other. Um, and also within the CC, like what kind of different groups and circles do we have and what is their mandate? Um, yes, for what I said, there is help for this building up the system um, um, and please feel free to ask for help or to look into into the constitution which I can share afterwards um, yeah then again questions but I think actually I could go straight to the structure or are there any questions no <laughs> okay then um, oh, how um, how do all these services and relate and who makes the decisions that affects um, multiple people so actually like you want to have small autonomous groups and you don't want teams beyond eight people because then it doesn't get effective anymore um, and you can also not hear all the people equally anymore so that is also like now with the restructuring that we really want to move smaller and not have so many different circles involved um yeah and then you have nested structure where the sub circle so that is here like the at the outside supports the purpose of the super circle so for example once again action and logistics organizes actions in order to um support the purpose of extinction rebellion netherlands of creating a role um, for generations to come like a sustainable world then the super circle facilitates the sub circles um so it helps you know it helps uh, and enables um fulfilling their purpose and usually you also work with a double link so the representative brings information from the sub circle to the super circle and from and the internal coordinator brings information from the super circle to the sub circle um, and then this way you have two to like information flow that goes better um okay then on decision making so in general when a rule or a circle has a mandate you are just allowed or able to make that decision you don't have to ask anyone for permission so if already um allowing like accepting a certain budget yes or no is in your mandate you can just do that and you don't have to ask like the upper circle for example the cc for permission but when it falls in, into multiple mandates then it is important to also get other relevant circles involved or to for, to, for example bring it to the cc um then what do you do when a decision doesn't fall into any existing mandates then you could for example create a new circle or a working group um, this was, for example, the case with the collaboration circle, because we were asked to sign all kinds of petitions, but we didn't really know like, who to ask for, like what to do with it. So then we created a new circle, which is called the collaboration circle, to be able to deal with these kind of things. Okay, then what do you need in order to make all of this work? Um, one of the things is really important is clarity on who does what. So that's the mandate, but also to visualize like how do these things relate. And you can do that with a couple of tools. One of them is Classwork, which you can see here. Um, I do think this is the global support visualization. Um, and this is done um, commu, and this is another way of visualizing it. So you really know how these circles relate. Then very brief, briefly applying this to the CC. Um, a couple of things that we also need clarity on our mandate as a CC. So what is our purpose? What are we actually doing as a CC? What are our accountabilities and, and domains? Um, and I think we made actually quite a big step um, now in because we clarified the relation to the rebellion also. So we actually, um, one of our accountabilities is also making sure that at least two rebellions a year are realized. So that may, like makes that we have more of a clear mandate. Um, then also strategy, like what is our strategy, what are our goals as a movement, but also as CC, um, which is also part of self-organizing systems, because with focus and clarity, you can then uh, make clear steps. So that's also why we have so many strategy meetings right now. Then governance, so how do we want to work together? And this is really like a lot about self-organizing systems. What kind of roles do we need? What kind of like circles do we need? How often do we want to meet? All these kind of things um, and it also comes back in the restructuring of the cc 
Um, so yeah, actually here you can also see the three different kind of meetings that self-organizing system often um, identifies, which is operational. So what kind of things do we do? For example, we organize a rebellion, then governance, how do we do that? So the whole structure and then strategy is like, really, what are our goals? What is our focus? Um, and our aim. So you kind of have different meetings on these kind of things as well. Um, yeah. Then we, communication wise, the CC is very often seen as kind of a black box. People don't really know what happens there. Um, and there's not so much local and regional interaction. So that's also something that we want to bring in more, like really also bring local and regional groups in, but also that um, we learn more from local and regional groups. Um, as well as that we start with general meetings again, where we invite people to um, talk about all these big issues and that's not only the CC discussing them. Um, and another thing for transparency would be visualizing our structure. So you don't need to find your way only through Mastermost and then reading all these mandates, but that's also just clear from a visualization. Okay, then actually that is kind of it. Um, so I think now it's, um, let me check. Yeah, I would say that now we just see if there are questions and if we want to dive into anything like very specifically. Um, yes, maybe I can first ask Caroline because it might be specific for this and then I come to your general questions, um, Lisetta. <laughs> yes, Caroline. I think it's maybe more general question like about, I don't know if you mentioned expiry dates or oh, maybe I missed it. Like, uh... No. no. You mean for, for role holders or? Yeah, for even for mandates and for role holders and for, um, yeah, maybe strategy or like basically anything it could be. Yeah, you mean like for how long does it hold or? Yeah, yeah and to update it and review it. Yeah, like usually with self-organizing systems, anything that works with consent, as long as everybody consents to it, it's fine. So you could you could make it an agreement about it, but you can also say like, we consent to it. So what we currently have in the CC is that you cannot be any longer than six months in the CC. Um, but then for example, if we feel, hey, actually this is not useful anymore, we can write a new proposal and we can, send, can consent to it then. So there's no like, strict rules on that it's just also really finding out what works for you in your specific context and it's true like it does require quite a bit of updating also with your mandates um and when it expires is actually when you experience a tension so we work with navigating by tension is that you don't need to do anything till there is a tension and that means that there is a friction between the current situation and how you would like it to be so for example um we would like to have a we don't have a clear strategy, we would like to have a clear strategy. So let's start with a strategy meeting. So the same goes for mandates. As long as your mandate is fine, you don't have to do anything. But if you have the feeling, hey, this is not in there yet, but I would like to change it, then it's time to update. Um, I don't know if that kind of, like, it's maybe a bit of a fake answer, but I hope it clarifies a little bit. Nice. Is that so? Yes. You're still on mute. Yeah, uh, yeah. direct point. Um, how does it work with changing a mandate? Because I can imagine you're not, like, yeah. are you allowed to just change it, but it can affect other circles as well, of course? Yeah, good question. So usually what you do is you go to the super circle. So the super circle is the outermost circle, and then you have a sub circle. So then, for example, um, if the newsletter sub circle of media wants to change their mandates, they go to the super circle of media. So they don't have to go to the CC, they can just go to the super circle above them. But if media and communication in general want to change their mandates, they need to go to the CC because they're in the CC. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. So yeah. In the, like changes in mandates does then fall into governance meetings of the CC. So then you do a proposal changing? Yeah. Okay, and then you discuss it with the CC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and for my general question was like, um, I've been like more than a year connected to XR. Yeah. Uh, and some things, of course, you learn along the way. Yeah. But I feel like it can be, it should be um, 
maybe that's also like what you are working on. I don't know, but making it more accessible for new people because I think can really help in for people also to speak up about certain things that maybe they thought were okay for half a year and then they discovered uh, there are actually more efficient ways or different ways of working together in, in yeah, a sense, not really like, a question <laughs> yeah no but i think it's a very good point because like why i'm focused on all of this is because i didn't get it myself when i joined xr and then i was like hmm, <laughs> how like what can we do with, yeah like how can we make this more clear so I think that's that's a very good suggestion. And maybe also if there are no more questions, we can also do a bit of a round on that. Like how can we make this function better and how can we um, also make it more accessible for other people? Yeah, so let's put that in, on a, in the parking space. And then if there are no more questions, we can get to that. Are there more questions? No. Yeah, another uh, more like uh, algemeen vraag. Um, are you going to um, like this presentation is accessible somewhere? Yeah, I can share it. Yeah. Yeah, you know where you want to use it for, but definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, I would suggest to do a bit of a round and maybe also you can say a little bit of why um, I will actually close the recording also because that makes it a bit more um, free to speak maybe. Um,